Uh, If you will, take your Bibles and open them to Acts chapter 12. Acts, the 12th chapter today. I want to read uh, a few verses of this chapter. We're going to look at all of the verses, the 25 verses in the chapter. We'll uh, study the entire chapter in the message uh, a little later. And then next Sunday, we start a brand new series of messages called The First Family of Christmas. And we're going to look at Christmas from the perspective of those who were there. And uh, also see how that affects us and how we tie into uh, the Christmas story as well. So excited to uh, look at uh, next week Joseph and the part that uh, he played in the Christmas story. And uh, men have a part in the Christmas story. And then the next week we're going to look at Mary and uh, the part that she played and women have a part in the Christmas story. And uh, then also Jesus and uh, we'll have the Lord's Supper on uh, on the 23rd, I believe it is, uh, that Sunday. And uh, which will be a special time for us uh, during this particular season uh, of the year. But let's look at uh, Acts chapter 12, beginning reading with verse number 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, That night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and the light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals, And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him, and did not know what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. They went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from the expectation of the Jewish people. I want you to be with me as we pray today. Father, we do come to thank you for your goodness to us and we thank you, Father, for uh, this particular season of the year, for the opportunity that we Uh, to give thanks to you, to remember all the good things you provided for us. And Lord, how good you've been to our families. Even in times of difficulty and struggle, your presence is always real, your strength is always strong, and your grace is always sufficient. And we thank you for those things today. Father, I thank you for the opportunity of being together as a family of faith this morning. Thank you for Olive Branch Church ask you to continue to bless it, to use it, to help us to be a blessing to people in this community. And Father, I pray for our worship today as you are here in our midst, presence of your Spirit. May our hearts be encouraged and soothed and peace be found through our relationship with you. I pray that you bless us as we begin our time of worship through song. And I pray that our hearts will be lifted up in praise to you as we sing these great songs. And then, Father, as your word is open, as we study this passage we just read, I pray, Father, that we'll find comfort, and that we'll find grace and strength. The things that we need today, we'll find from these verses. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, give Marjan a hand for leading us today. and Give her, just thank her so much and being... Uh, Used of the Lord, led of the Lord, and, and uh, do appreciate you, her so much. And 
Uh, you know, I just, uh, I love God's Word, and it, it never ceases to amaze me just how God's Word will minister and does minister. Uh, I remember when I uh, went off to seminary, and, and uh, I had different ones, you know, preachers at the time telling me, you know, be cautious about going to school and what you hear and all that. And, and I know that there were liberal schools when I went off to, to, to school, but I was fortunate enough to have uh, in New Orleans Seminary a very conservative uh, president that was running that school and, and professors. I remember the first uh, day that I walked into my Old Testament survey class, Dr. Harrison was our professor at the time. He walked into class that morning, we'll never forget it. He didn't have a book, he didn't have a Bible, he didn't have anything. And I just thought to myself, well, I wonder how this is going to go. And then he started that morning in Genesis and just quoted. And for the whole semester, he never brought his Bible, he never brought a book, but he had the entire Old Testament memorized from memory. I, I've never seen anything like it in all my life. Now, I remember one of those classes that we were, he was talking about the documentary hypothesis. He was a brilliant man. And uh, which that, what that is, is just uh, a theory that uh, scholars came up with some time back for the authorship of the book of Genesis. Of course, Moses is the author of the book of Genesis, but... You know, folks who don't believe that, just like they don't believe God created the world. And he was going through that whole thing and explaining all of it bit by bit and detail by detail. And I wondered, I thought, you know, well, I thought this guy was really conservative and I wonder where he's going with all of this. And about the time he came to the end of it, that was the only day that I ever saw him bring a Bible to class. He didn't open it that day, but he did pick it up and he held it as high as he could get. And he said, young man... This documentary a hypothesis tries to make a scrapbook out of your Bible. Don't let anything make a scrapbook out of your Bible. And that's the kind of teaching that I came up under. Uh, Dr. Taylor was my preaching professor. And I remember one day in class when he said, Boys, if you'll get on your knees and you'll pray and you'll ask God, he'll show you what books he wants you to preach out of. He'll show you what messages he wants, to pre he wants you to preach. And he'll do it before Saturday every week. <laughs> and I, I always, you know, now I've heard preachers say, well, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't do nothing until I get in the pulpit. Well, I consider that man, unless God gave you that message when you got up there that morning, a fool. I really do. I believe God expects you to prepare. I do. I really do. Am I saying that God couldn't change me and what he wanted me to speak this morning? Nope, he could. And is he, can he? He can. And am I willing? I am. But I also know what I've seen through all the 50 years of my preaching. And I, I just see it in remarkable ways. Over two and a half years ago in Greenville, I started on Sunday night preaching through the book of Psalms. Never done it in all my life, all my ministry. Never preached on some of them, but I never took Psalm number one, Psalm number two, Psalm number three, and went through the whole book. It's been two and a half years. I'm at Psalm 66. And here's the thing that amazed me this year. We came to Psalm 65 a couple of weeks ago. Right there in the middle of the book of Psalms is a group of four Thanksgiving Psalms. And look at when they fell during this time of the year. You think that's accidental? Uh-uh. I started preaching two and a half years ago. Been times when I couldn't be there on Sunday. God made it fall out that way. And I'm just simply saying, that when you need something, if you stay in God's Word, you'll find it. This week, at a time in our family's life when we were sort of walking through difficulty, and still are, we came to a passage, and the title of today's message is When Crisis Comes. Acts chapter 12. When Crisis Comes. I'm just telling you, whenever you need something, if you'll stay in the book, it'll show up. But now if you don't stay in the book, don't expect to find it. You've got to stay in the book in order to find it. So this morning, I want you to look at Acts chapter 12. It really is an incredible chapter in the book of Acts. The early church is moving along, it's growing, it's, it's, having, it's having dramatic growth. It's experiencing dynamic power and it has determined leadership. 
And here's what those things did. Those things, that dramatic growth, that dynamic power, that determined leadership of this young church in the book of Acts enabled that church to make a difference in its world and to touch and impact that world in a positive way. Now, here's what also happened. Because the church was making a difference in the world, it also became the blunt of some very devilish attacks and persecution. Now, we've seen persecution come to the church in the book of Acts before, and then there was a time of peace where the church had, it had rest, it said. That persecution had, had sought a stop because the guy who was behind it all got saved. But it comes back. The devil's never going to stop in your life. You do understand that. He's never going to back off. He might get pushed back. He might get a little further pushed back at times. But he's going to always keep coming. He's going to always keep attacking. He's going to always keep coming against your family, against yourself personally, and against the church. Because he wants to stop that cause and that march of Christianity if he can. And that's what you see occurring in Acts chapter 12. The church faces a crisis. Now, let me kind of try to explain the crisis for you. In the first verse of this chapter this morning, we're introduced to a person called Herod the King. Or sometimes he's referred to as Herod the Great. And what Herod did was, is that he rises up against the church. Doesn't like it. He doesn't like the cause of it. He doesn't like what the church did. So he rises up against it. And what he does is, is he takes one of the disciples, James, and he kills him. He's a, he becomes the first disciple martyr. Stephen is a deacon who becomes martyred for the faith. James is one of those disciples, one of those twelve, and he's martyred for the Christian faith. Well, what happens is Herod notices that it pleases the crowd so much that he arrests Peter, and he puts him in prison. And so what happens in Acts chapter 12 is that the church is facing a crisis. Anybody in here ever face a crisis? In fact, you might be facing one right now. You know, one of the things I say is that if you have come through a crisis and you're not facing one not right now, if you live long enough, guess what? You will face one, won't you? I mean, life is just simply that way. And here is the church. It's facing a crisis in its life. And so the point I want you to, to see today is this. In crisis times, God is able. That's one of the things I want you to remember and walk away from it. Anytime you're in a crisis, God is able. Our God is able. In fact, I like what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 when Paul said, Now unto him who is able. And then he goes on to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. I, I don't know about you, but I serve a God who is able. Amen. I do. He is able. He is able in any crisis. He's able in any situation. He's able in any difficulty that you face. God is able to help you handle that and work through that crisis. And so I want to just talk to you about a little bit today. When crisis comes, and there are three things that I learned from studying this chapter this week about that subject of when crisis comes. They're so simple, but they're also so important. I want you to notice, number one, that when crisis comes, God is required. God is required. Now, I know that some folks might uh, want to debate that issue. And I know that some folks might even argue with you about that issue. What do you mean, preacher, God is required? You don't think I can't make it through a crisis without God? Oh, people do. They do. They stumble through it. They somehow work through it. But I want to tell you what I've observed in 50 years of preaching. I've done a lot of funerals. I've done a lot of funerals uh, just like yesterday for people who were Christians and they knew God and they had lived that and we knew where they were going. I've also done a heap of funerals for those whom I didn't even know. I've had calls, multiple calls, still have them to today. Uh, a lot of times a funeral home in Greenville, if, if a family can't find any other preacher, they'll call me and ask, okay, can you come help this family? So I've been to, I've been to services where, where I sat down with a family, I didn't know that family, 
Uh, they were lost. They didn't know the Lord. They had no church connection. They had no preacher connection whatsoever. And here's what I know I've observed. I've watched both sets of families weep. And I'm telling you, there is a different weeping from those who know the Lord compared to those who don't know the Lord. There is a weeping that is pain, yes. There is a weeping that is hurt, yes. But there is a weeping that has hope in the midst of tears and that's what a person that doesn't know Jesus Christ doesn't have. And that's why whenever a crisis comes, God is required if you're really going to make it through that crisis. Now this church is facing a real crisis. In fact, I noticed a couple of things about the crisis when I was studying verses 1 through 4, which uh, helps us understand so much why God is required. And, and I noticed that there were two different kinds of times that the church was facing in verses 1 through 4. I noticed, first of all, that the church is facing what I call distressing times. Distressing times. Now, now notice verse 1, it says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Wouldn't you say that's a distressing situation right there? That's a distressing time for the church. Here's the church, it's trying to honor God. Here's the church, it's trying to follow God. Here's the church, it's trying to be a blessing in the community where it lived. And in spite of doing those things, all of a sudden, here is this man who has the power to just speak the word and one of God's chosen servants is taken out and goes into eternity. Isn't that something? That's a distressing time. You know, I just thought this week, life is distressing sometimes, isn't it? Life can stretch you, and life can stress you. It really can. In fact, you may have come in here a little stressed today. Sometimes we, we bring those things to church, don't we? Look, don't be ashamed of that. What better place to bring your stress than to the house of God? What, what better place to bring your burdens than to the foot of the cross? Amen? I mean, that's what the church is all about. That's what Jesus is all about. In fact, I believe he gave us an invitation when he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's where you're going to find rest. That's where you're going to find comfort. That's where peace can come for your soul. It can only be found in Jesus Christ. Here's the, here's the church, and it, it, it's facing a distressing time in life. And, and it, it, it goes to God. You see, in times of crisis, God is able. And that's what you need to remember today. But I, I noticed that, you know, God is required not only because of the distressing times of life. This was a distressing time for the church, but also because of the despairing times of life. This was a despairing time. It was a, it was a desperate time in the life of the church. Look at verse number 3. It says, And because he, that is king, the king Herod, he saw that it pleased the Jews. He proceeded further to seize Peter also. It was during the days of unleavened bread. In other words, Passover was there. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison, and he delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. See, he, he's a people pleaser, and he realizes what he did to James. It's pleasing those Jews that hated the church, so he isn't going to do anything to mess up Passover because he knows they're really interested in that because they're a really religious bunch, you see. And, and so he waits. And, and it, was a, it was a desperate time for the church. You ever been in a desperate time in your life? You ever just had one of those kinds of times in your life where you felt like, you know, hey, what? It, 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 it's, it's sink or swim if Jesus doesn't do something for me. It's sink or swim if Jesus doesn't help me through this circumstance I'm in, if he doesn't walk with me through this crisis. You know, one of the things that Andy said a moment ago when he prayed is that we have a Savior that's waiting for us. But you know what God just spoke to my heart when he was praying his prayer and gave me another thought that's, that's just as good as the thought that he gave Andy when he prayed, not only do we have a Savior who's waiting for us, our God is so miraculous that He can be waiting on us and also walking with us at the same time. Isn't that an amazing God? He can not only be waiting on you when you get there, but He's also walking with you while you're on your way there. 
See, he's already been through the portals of anything we could ever experience, and if we follow him, he walks us through all the way to the other side, and he's there to say hello when we get there. Isn't that amazing? That's our God. That's why whenever crisis comes, God is required, if you're going to make it through it with peace, comfort, and grace. And so when crisis comes, God is required. I want you to notice number two, but just one verse, verse five, that when crisis comes, and I love this, God is reachable. You know, it's one thing for me to tell you that you need God. That's one thing, right? It's one thing for me to say that when you have trouble in your life or you're facing a difficulty or there's a crisis that's coming up in you, it's one thing for me to say, hey, you need God. But it's another thing for me to be able to say, you can reach God. That's a whole other thing right there. You know, you, you, you need God, yes. He's required if you're going to make it through a crisis, but He's also reachable. So the question is, how do we reach Him? How do we reach God? How do we bring God into our lives? It's so simple, but sometimes we, we, we pass it over or sometimes we, we almost treat it as if, well, it's not as good as it is or it's not as powerful as we think it should. Notice how the church reached God. Look at verse number 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Here's the church in crisis. Here's its leader. One has been killed. The other has been arrested and put in prison. What is the church doing for Peter? Pray it. Oh, preacher, is that all they're doing? <laughs> you mean that's all they're doing? They're not contacting high security people? They're not trying to reach out to everybody they know? Well, don't they know God? Huh? Isn't that good enough? Really? I mean, seriously. Can't he do anything? See, sometimes we, we treat, oh, well, they just pray it. <laughs> As if, that's just another thing to add to the list. No, it's the secret weapon, folks. It really is. It's powerful. Prayer can take us places that we can't really go with our feet. In fact, I, 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 uh, I would have, if I'd have got it in time, I would have learned this, but this was so good. I, I never had read this poem. And, and, and I told Peggy, come down, I said, I, I still, I want to share this. Listen to this, I love this poem. It said, last night I took a journey to a land across the seas. I didn't go by ship or plane. I traveled on my knees. I saw so many people there in bondage to their sin. And Jesus told me I should go. That there were souls to win. But I said, Jesus, I can't go to lands across the seas. He answered quickly, yes, you can. You can travel on your knees. He said, you pray, I'll meet the need. You call and I will hear. It's up to you to be concerned for lost souls far and near. And so I did. Knelt in prayer, gave up some hours of ease, and with the Savior by my side, I traveled on my knees. As I prayed on, I saw souls saved and twisted persons healed. I saw God's workers' strength renewed while laboring on the field. I said, yes, Lord, I'll take the job. Your heart I want to please. I heed your call and swiftly go while traveling on my knees. Isn't that something? I'm just telling you, prayer can take you places that your feet can't take you. Prayer can take you into places that otherwise you would never be able to go. And that's how God is reachable. And here's what I want you to notice. I want you to notice two things about their praying. Because their praying wasn't just the usual praying. I want you to notice two things about their praying. I want you to notice, first of all, that they prayed faithfully. They prayed faithfully. Look at what verse 5 says. It says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but notice constant prayer was what? Offered to the church, to, to God, for him by the church. I circled the word offered in my Bible. It's an interesting word. It literally means to always pray. And, and, and what 
the text is saying that here's a group of people and they were faithful in praying. In other words, this isn't the first time that they just upped and said, hey, we got to pray. This isn't the first time the church gathered together and said, we got a crisis. We got to pray. In fact, if you start thinking about the book of Acts, it begins with a prayer meeting in an upper room where Jesus told them to gather and pray, doesn't it? And then you just start following that early church. Brother, they're gathering to pray. And they're praying, and they're faithfully praying, and they're just always praying. If there's a need, they pray. And sometimes we don't do that, do we? Sometimes we've got a need, but we think we can handle it ourselves. We just don't pray. But here's a group of people, they faithfully pray. But I want you to watch this. Not only did they faithfully pray, they fervently prayed. Notice that it says constant prayer was offered to God. God by the church. Constant prayer. The King James says without ceasing. They were just praying without ceasing. And the word literally is an interesting word. The word here, constant or without ceasing in the King James, it's one word in the Greek. And the word means stretched out. That's the word. They are praying stretched out. The picture is of a runner and he's, he's coming to the finish line. He's in the lead, but competition is right on his hip. He is running with everything he has. He is stretched out, the text would say, in his running. That, that's how these folks pray. I mean, it wasn't just a little old prayer. Folks, it, they are stretched out in prayer. There's a crisis going on, and they just, they just stretch themselves out. It is fervent prayer. You know, James said the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You ever think sometimes maybe the reason our prayers aren't answered is because we don't have fervor, we don't have passion, there isn't that driving, stretched out kind of praying. This church was praying and everything was laid on the line for it. That's how you reach God. God is required when crisis comes. God is reachable when the crisis comes. But I want you to notice number three, that when crisis comes, God is revealed. What I've noticed is, is that when you're in a crisis, you see it with the church here, when you're going through a troublesome time, you understand, i got to have God to make it through this. I'm never going to have the peace. I'm never going to have the grace. I'm never going to experience the comfort if I don't have God. And how do I get Him? I reach out to Him in prayer. I bring Him into my life. I'm able to go places. I'm able to do things. I'm able to see things happen that otherwise I'd never be able to experience unless I go to God and reach out to Him. But what happens is when you do that, God will reveal Himself. He will show Himself to you. And in this passage, I notice three things about God. Three things are revealed in this passage about God. I, I want you to look in these first verses and, and here's the thing that God reveals. God's ability is revealed. And I've seen it so many times. People in here could give testimony to it. You're in a crisis in your life. You go to God. You reach out to Him. And, 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 and His ability. Look, not mine or yours, but His ability is revealed. Look, look at verse number 6. It says, And when Herod was about to bring him out, that is, he's, he's, he's about to bring Peter out of the prison, that night, just the night before, the night before. You know, I remember one time I went to visit somebody and, and they said, well, preacher, you know, I've, I've, I've always heard it and, and you, even you've said it. And this person was dying. That God will give dying grace. But I don't feel nothing. You know what I said? The only words I knew to say was, I said, but you ain't needed it yet. When you need it, it'll be there. And I believe that. But what I found is, is that until I do need it, God doesn't dole it out. But when I do need it, He doles it out. And you see right here in this passage of Scripture, it's the night before. It's like the church is praying, but, but nothing's happening. Oh, don't ever think that. You know, God isn't asleep. He doesn't sleep or slumber, the Bible says. So you don't need to lose sleep. If God is up all night, amen? 
That's what Bertha Smith said when all the bombs were dropping in Germany. She said, I just lay my head down and go to sleep because the Bible says he never slumbers to sleep. So if he's going to lose sleep, why should I? And she just lay her head on the pillow and go to sleep at night. That's a true story. Her testimony, she shared it. God's ability is revealed. So here, here's what happens. Verse 6 says, when Herod is about to bring him out, that night, Peter was sleeping, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Verse 7 says, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, a light shone in the prison. Amazing, isn't it? And then, you notice what happens? God pokes Peter in the side, wakes him up. You know, sometimes when I read the Bible, humorous things come into my mind. I can't help it. <laughs> but I can remember Mama poking Daddy in this very building. She's back there. It wasn't the Lord, but it was Mama. She poking him. And Uncle Hugh and Uncle Buck and all of them, they'd, they had, some of them would snow on you, wouldn't have missed Doris if, it didn't, if you didn't watch them. But here, Peter's asleep. And he gets a poke from the Lord in the rib. And, and this whole story is amazing to me. Hey, if you can't laugh a little bit when you read the Bible, you're just missing a little bit, I believe. This whole thing is just, it really is a little humorous to me. Peter, you know, he's, a, he's awake out of sleep. You know how you are when you wake up in a, out of a dead sleep. And uh, so he's thinking he's still dreaming, you know, because uh, the chains fall off and uh, we're walking by guards and we're not chained anymore. And... and uh, yeah, I mean, it would make you think it was a dream, wouldn't it? And then later on, he wakes up and he finds out that, hey, this, this isn't it. In fact, the scripture says he came to himself. You, you notice that in verse number 11, when Peter had come to himself. He's fully awake. He understands now God's done something amazing. See, and the point is, the church is prayed. God was required in the crisis he was reachable in the crisis, and now he's revealed himself. Someone said, man's difficulty is God's opportunity. Man's difficulty is God's opportunity to just show up and do something amazing and marvelous. God's ability is revealed. And I, I, just, I, 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 just, I love this story. I read it so many times this week. I could, I could preach way longer than I got time to preach. But I, I, verse 10... That's just, I put a star by that. When my day needs to be lifted up, I'll come back to this verse. It says, when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Now man thought he came up with the first automatic doors. I don't know when they ever came out. But God was way ahead of him, wasn't he? <laughs> Isn't that something? Could you imagine that? Ooh. Automatic doors. They just, but you know what? I got to thinking about that this week. God does open doors that nobody can. Doesn't He? I mean, God, can, God can, can get you into places that nobody else could get you into. God can provide for you opportunities that nobody else could provide for you. Because God can open doors and God can shut doors. And God can control things. That's why you need God in your life. His ability is revealed. But I want to show you something else real quickly here. I won't stay as long on this point because I want to get to the last little thought here. And in, in, in verse 20 to the end of the chapter, 20 to 25, I, I just want to touch on this, but I want you to see that not only in this crisis is God's ability revealed, but God's accountability is revealed. You know, a lot of times we think this old world's just getting by. It's doing evil, it's doing harm, it's doing mischief, and it's just getting by. God's just letting them get by. Well, I believe God put this in here to let you know He isn't going to let, the, let them get by. Look at verse 20. It talks about Herod again. We come back to him and, and, and how he had been angry with some people of Tyre and Sidon. And, uh, but they had, you know, became good friends with one of his aides because he's the one providing for them. And so they, they have this big day for Herod. Verse 21 says, So, on a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne, and he gave this great orientation. In other words, he's making this big speech. And he's just going on. And, and, and when I looked at that, I thought, you know, that's, that, that's just the way it is today. The world thinks it's just going to be able to spout off like it wants to and do what it wants, and it's never going to be held accountable at all. 
And that's what Herod's doing. He's just spouting off. He's got this big old speech. And you notice verse 22 says, the people started shouting. What did they shout? They said, the voice of God, not of man. In other words, they said, this is God speaking. You know, you know what happened? In the next verse, God said, enough's enough of it. And I got news for you, ladies and gentlemen. One of these days, God's going to say, enough is enough. And verse 23 says, immediately the angel of the Lord struck him because he didn't give God glory. He's eaten the worms and died. That's pretty graphic. The Bible would just like to let you know how graphic God's judgment is. And one of these days, God's judgment's going to come. Look, the providence of God may work slowly, but it does work. And it will come. That's the accountability of God. But also, I want you to notice the last thought is the availability of God is revealed. God's availability is revealed. And I want you to go back to verse number 6, where it says, And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was what? He was sleeping. He was sleeping. Now, you know, I, I got to studying that a little bit this week. And I found out that Peter was, <clears throat> he was, he was somewhat of a sleepy head. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but he was. He was somewhat of a sleepy head. Uh, he, he, he'd, he'd nod off on you. He probably would nod off in church. You remember, uh, you remember the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is praying and he told those disciples, hey boys, y'all stay here and pray, I'm going yonder. And when he got back, what, what was they doing? They were sleeping. But you know what? When I studied this passage and began to look at the words, this is a different kind of sleep right here. This is a different kind of sleep. You know what Peter's sleeping in verse 6? He's sleeping the sleep of peace. It's almost like Daniel. He's sleeping the sleep of peace. It's almost like the Hebrew boys standing in the fire. They're standing in the stance of peace. How is that possible? I'll tell you how. It's possible to sleep the sleep of peace. It's possible to take the stand of peace. If number one, You've surrendered your life to the plan of God. But you've got to do that. You surrender your life to the plan of God and you can experience the peace of God. Doesn't matter what crisis it is. Because you see, here's what happens. When a person surrenders their life to the plan of God, then they also get surrounded by the promises of God. And it's the plan of God and the promises of God that produce peace in the life of a child of God even in the midst of crisis. Look, I still believe that God is able this morning, folks. I don't know what it is that you walk through or will, but I just know God is able. Look, I believe my God is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? I believe He's the God of Elijah and Elisha. I believe He's the God that parted the Red Sea. I believe He's the God that created everything I walk on or the air that I breathe. And if He is that kind of God, I'm telling you, He can do anything He wants to do and He can guide me through anything that I face in life. And the good thing is, He's able and He is available. Would you bow together with me? In just a moment, we're going to sing our hymn of invitation as we always do, give people an opportunity to respond to the Word of God and to the work of God in individual people's hearts and lives. See, all week we've been praying not only that God would enable us to preach the Word of God, but that God, through the power of His Holy Spirit, would do a work in the hearts of the people of God. And now it's come time for we allow God to do that work that He wants to do in our lives. If you're here today and you're lost, you've, you're not saved, you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, you've never followed what the Bible says, you should follow in accepting Him and standing for Him, then I want to encourage you today. Let me help you with that. Come and talk with me today about that. And hey, if you're not at that point this morning, then give me a call this week. My number's in that bulletin. Say, preacher, would you come talk with me about that? I, I, I want to know more about that step that you talked about today. But at least, 
make some move to invite Jesus in your life. I'm telling you, you need Him. You need Him now. And you'll need Him even more in the future. He's required. If you're going to find a sense of life and peace and contentment to live in, if you're going to have a future, God is required. And the way you reach Him is through a simple prayer and in that prayer, accept what Jesus did, God's Son, on the cross for your sins and invite Him into your life. You make that confession of faith. You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth that you are His child, that you are a Christian, that you've accepted Him. And I'd encourage you, if God's speaking to you about that today, to come. If you're here today and you're going through a crisis, a challenge, a difficulty, something in your life, I want to tell you that if you'll reach out to God, God will reach out to you. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. That's a promise. That's a promise and I've claimed it so many times and found it so true. If you'll reach out to God, He'll reach out to you. You'll find His ability and you'll also experience his availability in your life. He'll provide for you. He'll guide you and He'll walk you through the crisis times of life if you'll just trust Him for it. Father, thank You so much for Your Word today. Thank You that when crisis comes, You're there and You're able. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Would you stand together with me? Our hymn of invitation is 183. Only trust Him. If you have a public decision or commitment you need to make today, I encourage you to come. Let me talk with you about that. Pray with you about it as we sing this great, great song.